Well, good morning, and Happy New Year. So anybody make any resolutions, intentions, goals for 2018? Yeah, lots of you, right? The, the health clubs are filled with resolutions right now. <laughs> And you know, as long as we are living and breathing, we've got dreams, right? It doesn't matter where we are in the stage of life, how old we are, there's always a sense of becoming. And that's because the spirit of our being is always becoming. That we are always evolving. This year is a year to resolve to evolve beyond everything else, right? <laughs> to evolve spiritually in every way. And, and maybe to have specific things, goals, ideas, intentions, of how we're shaping that evolution, that process. So <clears throat> today I want to look at how our relations make a difference in our dreams. How our relationships can show up to either be in support of, or the demise of, <laughs> the manifestation of that which we are realizing and that which we are co-creating or working toward. Because it does make a difference how we are in community and how we are with one another, doesn't it? Whether we feel supported or whether we feel like our, our dreams are sort of tamped down. To give you an example, Asher Ocean Strickland was seven years old with big dreams. He had a dream that he would fish out of an airplane. And so he told his Aunt Darlene, he said, you know, I'm going to fish out of an airplane. And she said, oh, really? She said, that's unusual. He said, oh, no, people do it. She said, really? She said, I've never heard of this. He, yeah, Aunt Darlene, people do it all the time, and I'm going to do it too. I'm going to fish out of an airplane. He says, call fly fishing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, all the adults laugh like we just did. You know, but so often, have you ever had anybody laugh at your dreams? Have you ever had anybody tell you it wasn't possible? Or that you were being unrealistic in some way? That it just, it couldn't happen the way that you were envisioning it? So it's important, isn't it, to hold our dreams close. So when we initially get the spirit guidance for what it is that we're manifesting, to hold it close. And then to, when we do share it, when we do feel ready to share, to make sure that who we're sharing with can really hold, us, hold it up, right? That which we are becoming, that truth that we are embodying. A little bit later in this service, as you probably know, we'll be doing the white stone ceremony and receiving some kind of idea, spiritual quality, a new name that will guide us through this new year. And so we trust that, that whatever it is that we are guided to do really does come from that spiritual guidance, from that deep core of wisdom within us. And when it comes from there, it is that truest heart's desire, isn't it? So often we get confused, I think, with this idea of God's will versus our will. But ultimately, it's one and the same. <laughs> it's, it's our, our deepest heart's desire is God's will. It's, it's not anything different. And so I think that sometimes our fears or the things that hold us back are these ideas that we're going to be asked to do something that we're not able to do, or we're going to be guided into something that we're not ready for. And while some of that may be true, there may be pieces of that, some, some little bits of uncertainty or insecurity around that, it doesn't mean that we can't co-create that which is truly ours to do. In fact, we can. We know we can. That's the truth, isn't it? So um, my mom, years ago, and I went to a, a poetry class, and this was a really big deal for my mom. I mean, it was a big deal for me, too, to do this with my mom. But she had um, written poems occasionally over the years, and this opportunity came up, and I said, Mom, why don't we take a class together? And she said, oh, well, that sounds like a good idea. You know, she hadn't been in a classroom for 40 years. So there was a little bit of uncertainty. You know, and as the time got closer after we registered, she thought of every reason why we shouldn't do it. You know, she found out the class was three hour session. She said, called me up. She's like, honey, I, I don't know, three hours, that's a long time to sit in class. I don't think we should probably do that. And I said, well, why don't we just give it a try? She said, well, I don't know, I'll think about it. And so then a little bit later, you know, we're getting closer. 
She calls me up and she goes, you know, I've been thinking, that's really far for you to take the train from the city and, you know, come out on an evening and do this class with me. She said, it just seems like too much for you. I said, Mom, it's not too much for me. I'm happy to do it. I want to do it. We signed up. Let's do it. You know, so it's like about the third time I said, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to the first class and at the break, halfway through, if you don't like it or you don't feel comfortable or whatever, we'll just leave. We don't have to do the class. So she could agree to that, you know. So this is what we do when we support each other in our dreams, right? Where we recognize where people might be faltering a little bit in their certainty or their comfort around their dreams, but we just keep pushing them along, you know, holding underneath them, creating a little bit of a foundation that says, you can do this. You know it's your heart's desire to do this. You can do this, and I'll do it with you. Um, <clears throat> so then we went to class, and at the break, I couldn't find my mom. <laughs> Uh-oh, did she go to the car? Is she waiting for me, you know? <clears throat> thought, well, maybe she's in the bathroom, you know? Didn't find her there. I went to the bookstore, and I was really surprised to find my mom in the line already by the, the cashier, you know, waiting to, to check out. And she had in her arms, like, all these poetry books and journals and pens, you know? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I guess we're staying in class, you know? <laughs> she was so excited. She was so excited that she would do her homework immediately. So, and then she called me up and said, did you write your poem yet? <laughs> you know, and I was working full time. I was like, well, not yet. <laughs> Can I read you mine, you know? So it was just really exciting to be a part of that realization of, of her dream. And um, my dad, who was a very successful businessman, he had his own business that did very well, he was an engineer, said to my mom, I hope you won't surpass me. And it was just heartbreaking on so many levels, right? To hear this sort of tamp down and this, you know, just bald insecurity, basically, yeah. right? Spoken out. And, and I was so glad that my mom did not succumb to that, you know? Because it had been long enough. She had raised us all. She hadn't really had anything of her own. She had had occasional little part-time jobs. But this was hers. And this was her place to shine. And so when we support each other, we, we support each other out of that strength of spirit within us. And um, that's an important piece. And so we have to recognize, too, when we show up in these ways where we, we sort of are diminishing others, you know, and where we can then succumb to it ourselves and diminish ourselves. But props to my mom, she didn't go there. In fact, my mom ended up taking yearly workshops in uh, poetry. She'd find somebody to go with her, either me or my brother-in-law usually, or somebody who was interested in writing. And eventually she published her own chat book and she had a big book signing at a friend's store. And so it was a really big deal to her. By the time she got to that point of publishing her poetry book, a lot of the poems were about my dad and he had already made his transition. So she dedicated the book to him. And so <clears throat> some stories come out that way, right? A positive side, but some stories don't. Sometimes all it takes is somebody's comment like that somebody who we really care about, whose opinion we value, and that can completely deflate our dreams. So it's really important that we are strong within ourselves and clear within ourselves and, and clear with, with how we share and, and how we want to be with one another in uplifting and supporting. Theodore Roosevelt said, comparison is the thief of joy. And so often we get stuck in this comparison game, don't we? This is all a game of the ego, this I'm going to puff myself up in order to diminish you or I'm going to diminish myself in order to puff you up, <laughs> right? This is all just an ego game. And so that's not the game we play here that we want to play, is it? We want to play the spirit game. <laughs> and the spirit game is all about being big. It's about shining our light. It's about supporting each other. It's about cheering for each other and knowing that somebody else's success that we throw for has nothing to do with our success in terms of, of taking away from, 
Right? That's part of that lack thinking that says, if so-and-so succeeds, I can't. Or if so-and-so fails, you know, that somehow that reflects upon us or that means that that's the end. <laughs> you know, what did how, Thomas Edison, how many times did he try to invent electricity before he finally did? I can't remember, but it was some very, very long number. <laughs> and so those attempts at continuing to co-create to realize our dreams are also part of that journey, right? All along the way with my mom, she could have given up with all these excuses she came up with, all these reasons why she couldn't, out of fear, out of uncertainty, out of somebody else's comments. But to not go there, to not go to that place of comparison, to not be in this game of diminishment and, and um, diminishing ourselves or diminishing others, not play small, essentially. You know, maybe you were a part of a family, you know, that, that pretty much, whether spoken or unspoken, let you know that this is the way you fit into this family. Anybody feel like you had that kind of, a little bit of that, this is, this is how you get to be a Brown or a Jones or a Smith or whatever, you know? And so there's a sort of unspoken code or spoken code that says if you get out of that box, then you're no longer going to belong. Right? It's a false sense of connection. It's a false sense of belonging. But if that's all you got and you're a kid, that may be the kind of belonging that you feel like you're going to hinge on to. Right? But what happens when we do this, when we make ourselves small, is that we take this enormous spirit, right? this truth of who we are, this divinity in us that is meant to shine, that is meant to be big, that is meant to light up the world for everyone else. And we dim that light and we make ourselves small and constrict. And you can kind of feel that discomfort when we get so small and so constricted in order to make others feel bigger or in order to whatever <laughs> out of our fears. When we get that constricted and that small, there's a real discomfort, isn't there? Because there's a knowing that there's this big truth, this big spirit in us that wants to shine, <laughs> that wants to be the truth of who we are, that wants to show up with our gifts, that knows that we are here to walk this earth for the short time for some purpose, specific and general to be the very essence of love, perhaps, or the essence of peace, and at times, maybe a kind of specific clothing that we put around that at this time of year, for example, at the beginning of the year, when we begin to get clear, this is my word for the year, this is my name, this is my guiding essence, this is the resolution I'm making, this is the way I want to show up this year, these are some of my goals. We start to put some ideas, some, some sense of, of how it is that we want to shine that light in a new way. And a year is just kind of a natural marker, isn't it, for that? And so here we are on this precipice of that. But that's, that idea of shrinking, of, of being small for whatever reasons, becomes like this knee-jerk kind of habit. If we get into this sort of sense of that, or we grew up with that, and there's a sense of this, this in order to fit in, you must <laughs> you do this or that to be small in some way. Maybe. Maybe it shows up as like deflecting compliments. If you ever do that, you might notice that. Mm -hmm. Or other ways that it might show up, you know, just kind of self-deprecation in different ways. You know, different ways that we show up in that way that, that keep us in sort of those tight boxes. I was at a conference years ago that included some speech training. And during that time, I was giving a talk on playing big. And the uh, facilitators would throw out these things in the middle of your talk and you'd have to switch it to this style so suddenly you'd have to be giving it in a Brooklyn accent or you know you have to give it like a baby which was interesting like a preverbal baby it's like well what do I do I'm giving a talk you know <laughs> and then one of them that was so interesting because my talk was on playing big was to give it with the tiniest mouth possible <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you could just feel the incongruence, right? It's like painful. <laughs> 
And that's the point, because I had a visceral experience of how painful it was to play small. And that it is a visceral experience of how painful it is for us to play small. Like David read so beautifully earlier, that Marianne Williamson quote that we all love that's been attributed to Nelson Mandela and been you know, spread all over the world many times over. It's our deepest fear, you know? Our deepest fear is our light. <laughs> it's not so much our darkness. And playing small, it doesn't serve anyone. It doesn't serve anyone. All those people around us that we think we're making feel more comfortable so that they don't feel insecure, it's just a game of ego and it doesn't serve. What does serve is being your big, shiny, bright, brilliant light. To quote a Karen Drucker song. <laughs> I just realized that was a Karen Drucker <laughs> song line. <laughs> right? But when we are that big, brilliant beam of shining light, then others catch the light. You ever notice that when you're around people who are really positive, that really shine their light? And they naturally uplift you, right? Because they are naturally grounded in their spirit and unapologetic for their bigness. That's the kind of folks we want to be around because that's together the kind of world we create. Our world needs the light keepers, right? Our world needs the light shiners. It needs all of you to show up as big and bright as you possibly can. And you can never do that by constricting yourself, by being small, by diminishing in any way. And so this bigness, it's important. In Matthew, that famous um, quote that you probably know very well, you are the light of the world. And a city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel basket. I've never heard of that, actually. But we don't typically use bushel baskets now with, around lamps. But instead, they put them on a lampstand, right? So all in the house may have light. <clears throat> so let your light shine before others in the same way as a lamp would, as it beams the light across the home. Let your light shine in the same way before others so that they may see your good works and glorify God. And that's what we're meant to do. We see each other's good works. We see each other's triumphs and successes, and we glorify God. For that is the absolute expression of God right there and right then, isn't it? The truth of God is being revealed to us as somebody shows up in the truth of who they are shows up shining their light in such a way. So we need connection. We need, you know, we need community, but we don't need to create these false connections that say, you know, I'm going to make you feel better by playing small, or I'm going to make you feel less than by, by puffing myself up in an egoic way. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the truth of spirit being grounded in spirit. There's a kind of humility built into that power. There's a, there's a kind of awesomeness built into that when we recognize the power with which we've been entrusted by spirit. There is an almost, for me, almost a bring me to my knees kind of awesome feeling around that. And so it's not, there's a distinction between that kind of recognition of power and bigness and truth than there is between the sort of egoic, sort of, as I would say, tooting my horn kind of way of, way of being. There, there's, and we, and we, know, you know, we know this, right? We can cut through to that truth. We can feel that in our hearts and recognize that in our souls when we are interacting with others who are really showing up in a grounded space of genuine service, in a grounded space of, of, of the wisdom of spirit moving through them, guided in their actions by spirit. That's, I think, who we all want to be. And so when we gather community around us, we want to be clear about how we want people to show up. You know, in, in, in my mom and dad's situation, I, I wish they would have had like a really heartfelt conversation around that topic. I, I'm guessing they probably didn't, but you know, that, that's the kind of relationships I want in my family, in my home, 
you know, so, so if Brenly said that to me, we'd have a conversation about it. You know, and, and so I hope you will too. I hope you'll break patterns where, where maybe you haven't had conversations like that with your spouse or your partner or, or in your home, whoever, whoever fills your home or fills your life, your friends, to, to have those really clear conversations. You know, I'm going to support you in whatever it is that you want to create. And I'm really asking that you support me too. And that if you have doubts about what I'm telling you, that maybe you just kind of put a lid on it for a while. And let, let me be with spirit as I'm co-creating this. You know, that kind of honest conversation can go a long way for supporting each other. And also in a community like this, I mean, our community is built for support, isn't it? We're built to support each other through disappointments and to cheer each other through successes and triumphs. That's who we are in unity. And so that's what we want to continue to create for each other. That when we say, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing and I really want to create this, that everyone around us is saying, go, you can do it. I'm behind you all the way. And if you fall or fail temporarily along the way, I'll be the first one there to give you a hand up because I know you can do this. That's the kind of cheerleaders we want in our lives, right? That's the kind of people we want to be able to see the divine spark, the truth of who we are, and to call it forth more fully and more beautifully. To celebrate our successes, to cheer, and to, and to really be there for each other, to be the very best version of ourselves. You know, we may see people in the world who do great works, and we may be inspired by them. That's different than being in a place of comparison, right? into that thievery of joy that Theodore Roosevelt talked about. We don't want to be in that space so much. But if we see somebody out in the world who inspires us with, with what they do or how they do it, we can just say, you know, I want to be like that, but in my own version. I want to do what that person's doing, but in my best version of myself. Because that's the highest and best that we can be. We're unique souls for a reason, because each of us has something very unique to give to the world. And my greatest hope for us in 2018 is that we take this opportunity, this launching pad of this new year, to say, this is my year. This is my year to fully realize that truth of who I am. This is my year to evolve more fully, more fully maybe than I could have even ever imagined. And so as we move forward, we continue to dream to be in that place of, of possibility, of probability even. You know, somebody anonymous once said, dreams come a size too big so that we can grow into them. <laughs> and that's true. That's what, you know, even dreaming itself allows us to expand consciousness. Even when we cast forth our dreams, we are in a spiritual practice of expansion. We're actually practicing that bigness. We're practicing that light by saying, I'm dreaming. I'm, I'm putting out there. I'm, I'm working with spirit to be this next aspect of myself to draw forth, you know, it's already there. <laughs> it's already within us. It's already ready to be shown. Once we become ready, then we just let go of whatever it is that's standing in the way. And maybe it's this game of playing small for you. So today is our day to co come together with, with the Whitestone ceremony to, to, to sort of crystallize this idea of what it is that I'm manifesting this year. What am I co-creating? And allowing spirit to be in charge of this, we're going to um, take you through a ceremony. So just really want to encourage you, if you came already with some preconceived idea of what your word is this year, because you know the white stone ceremony, I want to really encourage you to let that go and give it another chance. Give spirit another chance to bring forth, because if that's really your word or your quality or your name, it'll come back to you and maybe there's something else. Last year I had the oddest word, and I would have never in my a million years dreamt up that word, but it came clear as day, and it was sever. And it was kind of an intriguing word for the whole year. I sort of had that on my altar and would consider, what does that mean? What am I letting go of? What is, what is there to sever? Um, so it was a really interesting guiding um, word, not as positive as I had always had my words be over the years, or I didn't perceive it that way, but that can also be a positive aspect. 
Many of us have just moved through the burning bowl at the end of the year, and that is a kind of severing, isn't it? A letting go, a, a shedding, a, a leaving behind that which no longer serves. And so I had a whole year of that. And so whatever it is that comes to you, trust. It comes from spirit. It comes from that deep wisdom within you. And it really will be a beautiful guiding word for your year. So in Jesus' time, the Roman prisoners, when they were freed, were actually given a white stone. And it was a mark of their freedom. And so similarly, the stone itself, for all of us, symbolizes this mark of freedom. It's a sense of freedom from whatever might hold us back, whether it be playing small or something else for you. And so this, the stone itself, I just invite you to have sort of a tactile experience with a particular stone that you've chosen, that this is the right stone for you. And it carries with it this idea of freedom and beauty, really. All the stones have a kind of unique beauty to them, just like you. <clears throat> and so the freedom might be letting go of particular old ideas of you know, not good enough, or those common kinds of ideas that can hold us back. It's always an opportunity to recognize that we're free from those. And this ceremony is also grounded in scripture from Revelation 2.17 comes this idea of given a white stone with a new name. Specifically, it says, let anyone who has an ear listen to what spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, or in other words, overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. And I will give a white stone. And on that white stone is written a new name, the name that no one knows except the one who receives it. So this name, this new name that you're given for the year, this spiritual quality that you're given for the year, it may be something that you want to kind of keep in secret for a while for you in spirit or it may be something that you feel guided to share with others. But just allow yourself that space to keep it to yourself if that feels like the right thing. And so on this white stone, we will write our intention for the new year. We'll write this guiding quality. So I just invite you to really listen, to listen to spirit, to open yourself to that truth that wants to emerge through you, to that divine idea and to trust that some delightful surprise may await as you receive this word. So now allowing that word, that quality, that new name to maybe even as you hold that stone, just seeing it kind of arise out of the stone itself. This new way of being for you. This quality that you'll embody throughout 2018 begins to emerge through you and onto the stone itself. And so as you feel ready and go ahead and bring forth that word and write it on your stone. silent 
strength my name expresses God in me on this white stone on this white stone I write my name and so I encourage you to allow this word to be a guiding word throughout your year where you ask the questions, you know, if, if your word is love and throughout the year when you have decisions to make, you say, what is the most loving thing I could do? What is the most loving choice I could make? So allow that to be visible for you throughout the year. Maybe you'll put it on an altar or carry it in a pocket or a purse or put it on your car dash or wherever it is that you'll see it a lot and maybe even have a tactile experience with it where the energy is kind of imbued with this the energy of the stone itself is imbued with this idea and your freedom. Your freedom from whatever might stand in the way from the truth of what is being embodied in you in 2018. So enjoy this guiding new quality, this truth of who you are throughout the year. On this white stone, on this white stone, I write my And so let's just close out with an affirmation reminding us to play big this year. Together, in 2018, 2018 I'm shining, shining brighter, brighter and playing, playing bigger. bigger. I, I resolve, resolve to evolve. evolve. Amen. <laughs>